back downfield. Rizzo. Around the corner, Scrum Killer has the demo. Kate up around. Very big down. Very big scores. And with that vitality, take it all. Hello, hello, and welcome to all the ball chasers, flip resetters, and rocketeers, and welcome to Esports in 30. We're so happy to have you with us today because we've got an amazing event to talk about. I'm Marissa Roberto. This is Nick. Well, Nick, I mean, you've been following our, all the RLCS season with Brody right here, and he was yep. actually there, but the finals happened uh, in New Jersey, and you watched all of it, and I know that you were super hype about it, so just give me the deets. Yeah, it was an amazing event. Uh, Jersey was, you know, some people were skeptical about New Jersey when yeah. we were heading into it because it's not, it doesn't have that same flair as, say, yeah. Vegas, but the, uh, the crowd was amazing. We got Golden Boy back in the fold to host, yes. which was awesome. Uh, the games were unbelievable. It seemed like every single series was just topping the one that came before. Uh, amazing goals, amazing storylines, and, and a great winner. Oh, absolutely. I was so surprised with it, but so, so happy for them. My Definitely. goodness. Uh, Nick, I think we need another injection of Rocket League hype into our veins. So before we welcome Lawler to the show to help us recap the LAN finals, here are the highlights. <laughs> Squishy, squishy off the back wall. Has a touch. Oh my goodness, squishy happened. AJ will take this from midfield. AJ carrying this, has the flip. What's he gonna do? AJ! Woo! Justin trying to get that off the wall to Garrett, but it was a little too slow. Justin again attempting the clear. Shut down by oh. PNG! And shot set! Are you serious? He's squishy. In front, Tander, back over to his oh. teammate. That's card back to Tander. Tander picks this up himself, the goes fake. under it. He oh. fakes, give it out. Tander scores first. Low key esports on the ball. Pay off the kill and JNAPS blows it downfield. Fairy Peak. Midfield, he's under one. Fairy Peak carrying this to get it off. Into the back wall. Score, kill, scores. Zero seconds. Unbelievable. Devo has a chance at this. Devo gets it. Creative, but it wasn't enough. And now squishy, air dribble pass into the middle. Oh, oh you're kidding! Shot. How do you even get this on target? Wander trying to find this one off the back wall. Drops it down! And Rome, it's you and lead. This win. Nice chip. Storsage tries to carry, he's got to sit on the cross. Pass. He finds a flip reset, finds a shot. Oh. Oh. Now, Algerepi trying to look for the pass back to PJ, but PJ will find control either way. And now Gary G trying to take it a pass, oh, and PJ's got him beaten. Here comes Maddox, what a shot, and puts it home. What a play from IGZ as they take their first lead. Struggling to break out, finally doing it. Justin, backward hit, oh. and oh my, just incredible. Bad touch, and Gale to get back to it. Scrub killer now, booms it back downfield. Rizzo. Around the corner, Scrum Killer has the demo. Kate up around. Very big down. Very big scores. And with that vitality, take it all. And here's a look at your playoff bracket. Congrats to Vitality and shout out to all the teams that made the season seven finals such an incredible event. So. Straight up, the highlight pack you just saw could have basically been our entire show. There were so many incredible moments from Jersey. And to talk about those insane plays and so much more, it's Adam Lawler Thornton. What's up, baby? Hey, I'm good, you guys. How are you? Okay, he didn't match my excitement level when he said hey, but <laughs> I, that's fine. I mean, I don't believe it. Jersey was incredible, and I'm sure you're super drained. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's start off yeah, right off the top. It was a long weekend. <laughs> yeah, long weekend with lots of amazing action. Let's start with Vitality here, because they kind of felt like the team of destiny. There was, you know, can't stop the K-Dop. You couldn't stop all of Vitality uh, at any point. Uh, Scrub, you know, stepped up huge in his first big land. Fairy Peak getting his first title, and of course, K-Dop getting his third. So it seems like, you know, the dream hack losses, the early exits of past lands, all mm. that is forgiven and forgotten walk us through the team's journey not just this year but like uh you know at this land as well because it means something different to each of the members yeah yeah i mean it all it all really starts with last season so they they came in scrubs finally able to play it's his first season and had a really rough performance they just did not perform well in uh in season six and a lot of it was just due to team synergy and not finding the right groove 
So they ended up bringing in Kadop. Uh, Fairy Peak, if you guys don't know, was Kadop's old teammate. Uh, they played twos, they're both French, and had never lost a twos tournament together ever. So they wanted that synergy. It was a decision that he wanted to do after leaving Dignitas. So uh, for them to come in, he basically wanted to change what this team was about and the fact that they were supported them by Scrupkula. Nobody knew that was going to be as well as it was, but. Uh, a lot of people were pretty confident about what the team was on paper. So mm -hmm. after it kind of developed, they started hitting this trend and no, not the best performances in LAN events, but it's still pretty competitive in league play to the point where they only lost to one team, which was Triple Trouble. So mm -hmm. for them, you know, six and one in league play, number one seed coming in, dominated regional qualifiers. Like they're in a really hot streak mm -hmm. and a lot of people consider them the best team in the world at like week two or three of league play. So people knew their potential is just they have a very volatile play style to where if it's on, they're the best in the world. If it's not, they're still pretty competitive, but it's not that great. So it was a matter of seeing what one we were going to get. Mm -hmm. And when they played Vitality, Vitality played G2 and lost. Like G2 mm -hmm. came in and, and I was harping on them. Like G2's playing like the best team in the world right now because they were, you know, they were dominating groups. They were crushing through uh, group stages and it's like, these guys are really good. Mm -hmm. um, but then Vitality played Cloud9 and swept them and held one of the most prolific offices, offenses in the world to two goals. And my opinion changed. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, like they played like Vitality played energy. I'm like, OK, it could have been a little bit more, but like they still beat energy. Great. You know, Vitality did really well. Um, but it wasn't until they dominated Cloud9, like it was a really close series, like three of those games went to went to one goal differential. Like it was it was not a stomp by any means. It's just the boost control that they had, the speed of which they were getting to, the saves they were making, like those little intangible things that you don't really notice, the aggressive play and like the bumps and the demos, you don't really show on paper or in stats. Um, but it was glaring and you could tell. And at that point, I'm like, yeah, the, I was the only one to predict Vitality over Cloud9, so go me. Um, <laughs> but at that point, you knew like these, no one's going to beat these guys. Yeah. If they play like that, no one can beat them. And lo and behold, they went through the big three in North America in with two losses. So they went 4-1, 4-0, and 3-1. Like, and they did that back to back to back. So yeah, they're the best team in the world by, by far. Okay, so best team in the world, but now that he matches Turbo as the three time, does this make KDOP right. officially the best of all time? Uh, he was never not the best of all time. Oh. Even even with Turbo being a three-time world champion, KDOP is the most prolific. He has the most winnings, the most earnings. He's a five-time regional champion, back to back to back to back to back. Like, the guy is insane. He's the best striker in the world. Like, he is, like we said, the gatekeeper. If you're going to get and win a world championship, you go through KDOP. So, without a doubt in my mind, KDOP's easily, like, how is he not? But then, were you not blown away when he was released from Dignitas? I still well, don't... he decided to leave, I believe. Okay, he left. okay. He chose to leave. Yeah, it was but... his decision because he wanted to play with his his fellow Frenchmen, you know? It was something that he'd been okay. actually wanting for a while. So okay. that level of chemistry and comfortability, I think, just shows even more. Like, he was more animated than we've ever seen mm -hmm. at the World Championship this season. Mm -hmm. Like, this was a true team. Like, we're all friends. We all really want to compete. We all really want to win. And it showed. Like, the excitement from anything, the fact that we had a Fairy Peak interview, like... yeah. yeah. Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> that, so you did uh, quickly touch on them, and they were playing unbelievable. It was G2. Uh, they also made the grand finals. But heading into this event, you know, there might have been some doubts. We were sitting here a yeah. the league play interviews and talking about how, you know, it wasn't necessarily clicking all the time, mm -hmm. and there was some doubts. But here they are. They made land finals, and it all came together. So what happened between then and now to take G2 from kind of living in that shadow of C9 and NRG to making finals? Mm -hmm. It's it's a similar situation to Vitality where you start to get hot towards the end of the season. At the end of the season, uh, bringing in Chicago and stuff is always kind of a weird opinion of how is it going to perform? What's it going to do under land pressure? Is the play style going to adapt? And they always struggled with offense. Um, they when they brought in Chicago, you started seeing this connection between Jane Apps and Chicago, but it left Rizzo in this weird spot. And I don't like Rizzo on defense. I think he's one of the most creative players on offense. And you saw that numerous times. Like there was a play where he 
went up, he like dished a pass, he kind of just lobbed it in front of the net, and then immediately after, and it was on a deflection, he goes in and he bumps the goal and leaves it wide open for his teammate. And Chicago just comes flying in and scores it. It's like little things like that nobody else does. And when he's forced to be back on defense, things don't go well. And then he has to force himself to move up and then they get counterattacked and scored on. So even though we consider them one of the big three and the reason why is because no matter how they play, they still get wins. You know, they were undefeated for, you know, three, four weeks. So we knew they could be better, but we just weren't seeing it. So it was a mixture of that as well as trying to figure out, like, how are they going to perform on land? Is Chicago going to step up to the plate? You know, he did well for Evil Geniuses, but is he going to do well with a new roster with different kind of styles? So that's always a concern. We're never really sure, but he really brought it. Like, best JNAPs has looked. Like, JNAPs would yeah. be MVP if they would have won by far. Mm -hmm. He had a really rough offense on day one, but his defense was phenomenal. And then he started to come into form and play even better, which made Rizzo able to move up. Chicago started playing a little bit faster, but when they played against Vitality, they literally just didn't have boost ever. So they couldn't really do that, which is more credit to Vitality than it is G2. So um, yeah, like obviously there's always concerns coming in, but they performed admirably. Like they went undefeated in groups, all of North America did, which was super mm -hmm. weird. And then they crushed their old teammate. They crushed PSG, even though it was probably the, one of the best matches, uh, PSG G2, super close. But like you could tell they were doing things the way they wanted to. And that's always the difficulty of LAN is playing your play style against that level of pressure. And luckily they have the crowd behind them, yeah. but it's not easy to perform like you do in scrims or online in the comfortability of your own home. Well, yeah, for sure, that makes yep. sense. I mean, you mentioned, yep. of course, NA just uh, making names for themselves here, but I want to talk about Rogue because they continue to rise with a very strong performance at LAN. So while I do want you to touch on the performance of the whole team in Jersey, I want to focus on the man who tends to be last in line when you talk about Rogue, Wonder. So how did he step up big time at LAN and really prove himself? Because he was huge. Yeah. Wonder, that double touch is probably the cleanest double touch I've ever seen in my entire life. It was a challenge from the left left wall to midfield, and then he plays it bottom right with like a negative angle. It was just disgusting, um, which says a lot because Wonder was a lot of people's decision of you should keep Prime Thunder, you should get rid of Wonder. And that's very stressful on a player. The ability to handle that kind of criticism and then step up and prove everybody wrong with being an older guy that's newer to the scene like this is his technically rookie year even though they played with FlyQuest this is his first time of going to land they fell just short because energy beat them last season so um they were a similar situation the fact that they got through regional championships they had to win two uh two series to get there um and they just hit a hot streak but i don't think anybody had expectations of them to play like that it just they blew a lot of people away. Their group was pretty stacked. It was probably the most competitive. A lot of us agree. A lot of us believed Barcelona was probably going to take one. Mm -hmm. And then it was either going to be between them and Renegades. But Renegades fell really short, yeah. uh, which is a whole different story to go into. But um, Rogue surprised. Um, I think a lot of it does have to do with Kronovi, and you have to give that boy credit, what he's done for that team, that veteran status of being calm and collected. And they even said in their interviews for Wonder just the the benefit of having someone that's been there before to calm the nerves and point out mistakes and that's not easy to do because you get so caught up in the moment when it's your first time in an arena setting with you know seven thousand plus people yelling at you um you get lost in it so the fact that Kronovi's there to kind of keep it cool and collected and say like hey man we're, we still got a series to win you know mm -hmm. or you know pointing out mistakes if they are behind uh shows a lot but very rarely did they find themselves behind um Credit to both him and AJ, both of them. Um, you can't say it enough to come out on your first land and, and perform like they did and hit the shots they did. Like, Kronovi didn't score a single goal in day one. Yeah. Like, what? That makes no sense. Normally, that's the only way they win is if Kronovi scores every goal. So, um, big credit. Yeah. Wonder played extremely well. So did AJ. So did Kronovi. That's why they found themselves in the quarterfinals. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's nice to see that they were keeping it calm as well, but also the Wonder with like the the, the mad fist pumps and keeping the hype up as oh, well. Dude, you know, I mean, so, self so psyching, right? Self psyching. Which is crazy because he hit that other double touch where he came off the right wall and he like hit it at an angle. So it mm -hmm. like hit his wheels again to pop over and he didn't move. He didn't do anything. <laughs> and I was like, you just, what? 
Like, how are you not reacting to this? And he's just stone cold. And he's like, we got to win. And that was the only thing on his mind. So it was interesting to see the phases of wonder throughout the tournament, I guess you can call it. Nice. Sure. Uh, I want to shift to EU here because you did kind of, we did touch on them, you know, FCB, Triple Trouble, mm -hmm. PSG. They all made the quarterfinals and they all played pretty well. But overall, maybe it kind of lent itself to like a bit of an old school NA versus EU vibe since every mm -hmm. single quarterfinal matchup was an NA versus EU with none of the other teams making it through. Uh, did you kind of get that feeling of this old school NA oh, EU definitely. vibe? Oh, it was, it was a fantastic clash. Um, only because the only reason it went that way is because NA won every single group. Like, yeah. there was a lot of people complaining about the format, this and that. I'm like, dude, none of us had expectations that N or NA was going to win mm -hmm. and go undefeated in every group. Like, no one could have planned for that. So the fact that it did happen, and then we got to see the number one seed in NA versus number one seed in EU, number two seed in NA versus number two in EU, three, four, the whole way across, we were all like, this is great. Yeah. Like. How can anybody be upset about the fact that the format worked out like this? This is amazing. We never get to see it until like the grand final, and now we get to see it every step of the way, mm -hmm. um, which is awesome. So I loved it. Uh, the fact that NA did what they did, I mean, it was historic. We've never seen that before, ever. So uh, right. shout outs to NA, finally <laughs> proving that we are good, but still not the best. Could not have scripted Yeah, I couldn't better. quite take yeah. down Vitality, but we, we got everywhere else, so. Still there yeah, right? so close. Uh, okay, well then, what did you think overall of the non-Vitality EU teams in Jersey? Uh, PSG was extremely close. Um, I think they, being the only returning EU team, did really, really well. Uh, Triple Trouble for their first performance, a bunch of rookies as well. Uh, won the hearts of a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of family vibes and stuff, which was really cool to see. Um, other than that, like just tough competition. I think Barcelona could have had a better day. They just fell flat in their quarterfinal, mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate. I think Cloud9 just came out and really had a, a point to prove. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that they got swept was kind of weird. So I think Barcelona kind of underperformed in their, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, good performances. Everybody played really well. I don't think any one team like really, really underperformed. I think. The only ones that were noticeable is PSG had a lot of mistakes in their last, yeah, their last series against G2. I think they could have taken it if they would have cleaned it up a little bit. They threw away possession pretty often. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Triple Trouble could have went both ways, but I think the crowd really favored Rogue and that yeah. was partially it. Um, but Rogue had a, was like on a mission and that mission was to give us uh, Kenobi versus old team. So I'm okay with it. All right. Now, I want to quickly touch on something that I kind of noticed throughout this tournament because you mentioned it when you were talking about Cloud9 versus Vitality, where it was really, you know, we, this was a tournament with so many high offense teams and so many talented players, but it also seemed like yeah. defense like defined oh, this tournament as much as the, uh, you know, more than the offense as much. How have you seen kind of the defensive side of Rock League grow and play into this, this tournament? It's um, the best way to explain it is if you watch, like, part of the reason why Scrub Killer, in my opinion, won MVP is his defense. Um, you look at it in the G2 series where plenty of shots were happening, but because the rotations were so clean, he's able to make some of these incredible saves that normally you just wouldn't see. And the only time you can do that is if you're in full stride, you know, you're, you know, letting the boost go as much as possible and you're there like split second. Um, because teams have gotten so good, um, offense has always dictated Rocket League, especially when it comes to the meta, just because it is better to be the one passing into midfield and taking a shot than it is to be the guy in net trying to jump and make a save on a shot that's too fast. Right. Gotcha. Um, but the fact that these players have gotten and slowly changed their play styles and adapted to the fact that these shots are coming in, pre-jumps are happening, you know, they're deflecting shots in midfield. They're trying to prevent them in the first place. Midfield defense is what we refer to it as. Um, but a good a good team is going to make it so the defense stops them at the midfield rather than in front of their own net. Mm. Um, but if they break out, I mean, you're relying pretty much numerous times G2 had to on one player to jump and make a save against a 1v2 or whatever the scenario is, which always favors the offense. The only time it doesn't is if you're in like a one situation, eventually it gets to the point where the back wall is closer to the player than it is the, the goalie per se, because they can go into the net. So um, the fact that this is happening in high pressure, high pressure situations and they're still making saves, uh, in one-on-ones or otherwise, or you know, they're sweeping across and making a last-ditch effort is is unreal. It is literally the reason why Vitality ended up in the place they did. Um, 
so yeah it's becoming more i don't think it's becoming any more of a focus or anything it's just it is something that is intrinsic to play nowadays you have to have really good defense because people are going to put on shots i mean g2 put on 47 shots in one of their games like that's unheard of the fact that each player is able to put like one player i think put on like 11 or 13 shots in one match sometimes you don't even see that in an entire best of five series so um some of those have to be saved and it's very very heartwarming to see these players not only get love for offense but also defense because normally it's the flashy high style flip reset whatever you want to call yeah. it that gets all the love so the fact that defenders are starting to get some love same thing with support players um i love it i absolutely love it yeah. uh, speaking of uh, something that needs a little love as well we saw south america at the RLCS for the first time, and personally, I was super impressed. Uh, they brought be a lot of us waving those flags right now yeah. on the screen. Like, yeah. yeah, you guys had the, the, the flags on the desk yeah. there. Uh, I was super impressed by like their tenacity. For example, like there was a player I remember. Yeah. I think it was PJ. He had like zero boost. Challenges the ball, wins it, goes up the wall, challenges the ball in mid air, and mm -hmm. wins that one, and it leads to a goal. Right? Like that's just su such fantastic aggression and no nerves on stage. Right? So, what did you think of like INTZ and Loki, and how significant was this event? for the growth of what we'll see in Sam. I mean, it, it's massive. Uh, shout out to Chimanko as well, the uh, guest analyst that we had. Um, but he hit the nail on the head when he was on desk. You know, they've been waiting three years for this moment. You know, the South America scene has been around forever. Um, I used to play with a couple of South America players when I was first starting out, uh, just because ping wasn't too bad. But they, they've definitely been a part of the scene. It's just they haven't had consistent tournaments to play in before the grand series which is what our path to rlcs is for south america the biggest like south america tournament was hosted by a pro player it was hosted by jacob mm -hmm. yeah. like they just haven't had the funding or the exposure that they've deserved but the scene has still always been involved so for them to come out and be able to play and then perform as well as they did i mean you want to compare them to the oceanic region the first time they came out mm -hmm. and it's world's difference so you have to look at it in that sense where Oceanic region comes out, they you know don't win any series, whatever, but they still are relatively competitive. Um, but by the big guys, they get smashed. They go back to their region, they you know take all this information they've learned on how we play, and then they introduce it to their teams and the teams get really good. And then they come back six months later and it's like, wow, these guys really improved. So the fact that South America is getting that same opportunity now moving forward is kind of scary because of how well they played against all the top teams like there was a couple moments where they could have upset majorly um Lo but when it came versus to cloud nine comes to mind oh, it was probably oh, closer than it should have been definitely same thing with energy energy and itz like energy definitely gave them a little bit more respect than they should have but uh that's part of the reason why energy won is the ability to be an experienced team and bounce back from that but they you know they were on match point a couple times that they had to be careful of so um, they came out to play. They originally nerves were kind of problem, possibly because of the controller issues that were going on. Mm -hmm. It may have settled those nerves because we had to fill for a match for like 30 minutes, oh, yeah. which was super fun. <laughs> um, yeah. I almost ran out of stuff to say. Brody's like, dude, I was out of questions. Like, I don't know. What. <laughs> but yeah, it was. Uh, I think that helped a little bit. But even still, you can't ignore the fact of how well they played. Um, and the fact that they get to take all this experience as a true team, you know, and we're already seeing roster swaps happen, like Renan's now leaving teams and it's crazy uh, to see that they have a roster split happening early, which I think is good because it allows them to focus then on the on the further uh, for next season. Yeah. But for them, they they are going to have now a six months to take everything that those teams learned and still that into their region mm. and then bounce back even tougher, well, even tougher. Like they have four really competitive teams um, that are only going to get better. And if they're able to keep it this close against the best in the world in their first chance, yeah. um, watch out for them next season. They're going to yeah. be really good. I'm hyped, man. I'm hyped. Yeah, yeah, it's me good. Scary for the other teams they're playing, but like so exciting yeah. for us. Yeah. How amazing are these underdog stories? Um, okay, so any closing thoughts for the storylines and amazing moments from Season 7 as we look ahead now to Season 8? Um, Rocket League's coming. Um, <laughs> we've all been waiting for this next big push for Rocket League because we know its potential. I know Brody tells you guys probably all the time. Yeah. Um, but Rocket League is catching attention again. The fact that we, I think this season, I think the biggest thing for me was that we had a big focus on the families, the community, the mm -hmm. what Rocket League is really about. Because it is a very unique esport in that sense. I know, Marissa, you've hosted for us a couple times for Gnarly, and you've gotten a taste of it. The fact that all the players shake and high five and hug after matches, they're not trash talking each other. You know, there is clicks and stuff, but at the overall side of it, 
they're all friends. You know, they all get along. They all are respectful to each other. There's not this crazy banter like, yeah, Turbo throws some shade on Twitter every once in a while, but they're all friends. You know, they all hang out. So the fact that there was a major focus on that, I think, uh, this LAN was really, really awesome to see. Um, but it also the fact that we're getting national attention, you know, setting the world record with the Mexican wave, the yeah. Uh, the viewership, I think, is the most organic that it's been. Mm. Um, in the past, people used to come in to watch for fan rewards and get in-game items and stuff, but yes. those items have been kind of the same for a while. So, like, the fact that, you know, we're pulling 200k viewers again plus is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and it's not due to rewards. It's just due to this is really exciting to watch. So uh, Rocket League's on a great place. I can't speak to it due to the position I'm in, but... Yeah. I'm really hopeful for what Epic acquisition does because that should close the end of this month. So I we'll know. see what happens. I it's mean, gonna be we're, exciting. we're excited too for you, Lawler, for Brody, of course, for just us now as fans of Rocket League to get to watch. Yep. Yeah, it's incredible for the community. I cannot wait to see where this thing goes. Uh, thank you so much for breaking down the finals with us. Get some rest because uh, we all need to charge up for another RLCS season coming soon. Better, better. Season eight, hopefully around the corner. Oh, that Lawler coming in here looking like a damn snack. Nicholas! I didn't say that. Because <laughs> he's snack Lawler. It's okay. He appreciates it, I swear. Uh, okay, let's wrap up all of this with a few quick thoughts from you. First of all, I, I just need to know your MVP of all these. Yeah, so I actually, this is another one of those cases where I actually agree with what the broadcast landed on. They nice. picked Scrub Killer, and I think that that's a pretty clear choice. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a rookie coming into his first RLCS Finals land, and he showed very few signs of nerves, landed some huge goals in clutch moments. And one of the things that I think we saw from Scrub as well was that, you know, in past criticisms and in past terms, yeah. people were saying, especially last season, mm -hmm. people were saying, oh, maybe, you know, he's coming from ones, He's still a little bit underdeveloped. Maybe his mm. teamwork isn't quite there. But at this term, you saw great teamwork out of Vitality. He was looking for passes and, uh, you know, in a spot to receive passes as yeah. well, right? Just It seemed like he was just a lot more mature in his gameplay. And you'd expect maybe a rookie with so much expectation, so much hype, mm. to have a lot of weight on his shoulders. And you just didn't see that out of Scrub in this tournament. So a very well-deserved MVP. Uh, absolutely. And just thinking back on even his tweets after last LAN, his tweets after even last year's performances, I just feel like now he really is the most improved player as well. Like, if they could give that award yeah. out, it would 100% I mean, go I think, I think it was a case of, you know, he always had so much talent and so much yeah. potential. We just needed to see him execute in on the stage and to see him do it uh, for the first time mm. and, you know, rightfully win the title is, is incredible. Uh, of course, when something wraps up in such a way, we do need to talk about the future, the future of RLCS, right? Because obviously they made this deal with Epic, Psyonix, mm -hmm. Psyonic and Epic have made a huge deal. Um, some people trolling it, of course, at the LAN, but I want to know your thoughts on it. What do you think will happen with the RLCS moving forward? So I think this event, kind of in the wake of the Epic merger, the Epic mm. acquisition, uh, I think there was maybe something a little bit to prove, but since kind of we haven't seen that influence or as far as we understand mm. it, right? But it, it really paid off. Like I said, the games were amazing. Um, the atmosphere was fantastic. The fans were amazing. And that really was kind of what makes a Rocket League event a Rocket League event, right? Yeah. It's not the biggest game, but I, I saw people from like Rainbow Six and Counter-Strike and Dota who were like, you know, uh, members of G2 or just kind of fans of those games being like, man, Rocket League is hype. Yeah. And it is hype, right? It's exciting. It's a game with a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. And it, it's weird to say that about a game that's kind of in its seventh competitive season. But we do get two per year. So it's been around for about, you know, three years yeah. or so. But it does feel like, and one of the things that I, and don't take this the wrong way, by the way, guys. One of the things that I do say a lot about Rocket League is that it's everyone's second favorite eSport. Which, which is, it sounds negative. But what I actually mean by that, right, is it's going to be hard for Rocket League, in my opinion, to get as huge as mm -hmm. your League and your Dota and your CSGO just by the okay. nature of the game. Mm -hmm. However, like, like I said, a lot of other communities were looking at the Rocket League World Championship and be like, damn, this is sweet. This is cool. Yeah. The gameplay is exciting. It's easy for us to understand. And there's something here. And if other pros from different esports yeah. who know good high level competition when they see it, mm. obviously, are saying, hey, man, Rocket League is hype. Well, there's yeah. surely something here, right? So Absolutely. I think this was a, a really great sign. And every single land just impresses. The games get even yeah. better. The players get more comfortable. I, I just, it's really exciting to see what could happen for Rocket League, not just at the end of this year, but I think moving forward for next year as well. Oh, 100. But then I'm always going to think about, well, our other second favorite esports have now gotten franchising, right? So do you think maybe, possibly, we could see hmm. this for Rocket League? Because I, I've I always thought that this should be the esport to become franchised, yes. to be on TVs, because everybody gets it. So the main question for me is right now we have eight teams in NA and eight teams in EU. 
mm. right? So maybe you want to first expand to 10 teams mm. or something like that to see if the talent pool is deep enough to sustain a long-term franchise model, right? Because eight okay. teams is at the highest level is not that much, right? In other leagues, you see 10, you see 12, you see 14, right? So I think that's step one. That probably won't come this year. It'll probably come next year. But if, if they do see that the talent is there and people are interested and there's still excitement around, mm. you know, and still young talent co up and coming in Rocket League down the line. However, they can't wait too long. I agree. They can't wait too long. And you're, you're right. I think Rocket League is one of those sports that would, or one of those esports that would have kind of that sports feel to it yeah. in terms of localization. And it's like I said, it's a lot easier for under, to understand for more casual fans, right? Yeah. There's a big difference between Overwatch, I'm trying to become a fan of my local Overwatch team and yes. I have no idea what the heck is happening. Exactly. And, you know, holy crap, FC Barcelona becomes the Barcelona team and all of a sudden we're watching car soccer as well as normal soccer, which is which is great for those fans. So Yeah, it's such an easy style, such a great family-friendly game. There's a lot there's of so question marks. Things. There's a lot of question marks around franchising and what they're going to do with the RLCS mm -hmm. moving forward and the DreamHack circuit and all that yeah. sort of stuff, but I, I think that there's a lot of good things to come for Rocket League. I agree. I know you're excited. Listen, I am too. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you to Lawler for calling in. As always, a reminder, there's no new shows tomorrow or Monday as we celebrate Canada Day right here in Canada. You can celebrate too. Put syrup on everything. We'll be back on Tuesday with more Squad. Until then, connect with us on all our socials at Squad State, and we'll see you later.